This is your three-minute radiation fallout forecast for Tuesday, December 27th, 2011. Alert! Over the past three days, numerous areas of gamma radiation were detected in Europe with iodine-131, 133, and cesium-137 being detected and reported in southern Europe on Eurodep. For more information and to check radiation levels in the U.S. and Europe, please visit FukushimaFacts.com. The following areas in Canada, the U.S. and Europe are at highest risk for potential fallout over the next 24 to 48 hours and should exercise full mitigation and avoidance of all precipitation and wind. In Canada, rainfalls forecasted for the southern portion of British Columbia, especially around Vancouver. In Alberta, from the U.S.-Canadian border up through Edmonton. Heavier rain bands are currently on radar east of Sudbury, moving into Ottawa and Toronto over the next 24 to 36 hours. In the U.S., rainfall is forecasted for the southern coast of Alaska, all of Washington and Oregon, and the most northern part of California. Current rain-snow mix is passing through Idaho and Montana. Dense rain is currently extending from Louisiana up through the Chicago area and into northern Michigan. This entire system will be moving east over the next 36 hours. Water vapor bands are extending through the states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida, placing these areas under highest risk for fallout. In Europe, rain is forecasted for southern Greece, all of Ireland, and the central UK. Rain and snow will be passing through all of Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Also, rainfall is forecasted for Poland, Belarus, and the Ukraine. The resources for today's forecast were the World Infrared Map on Eldorado.weather, Canadian Weather Radar from Environment Canada, Intellicast, the Weather Channel for Europe, and the Water Vapor Loop from the University of Washington School of Meteorology. This forecast has been brought to you by Radchick and the Orion Talk Radio Network. We care about you because your government doesn't. Please check Fukushima Facts for links to the radiation monitors. Be safe. Hey folks, talk about keeping your eye on the ball. Big shout out to our buddy Anonanoid uh, showing us this uh, article that just came out. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, we're really targeting uh, the nuclear fallout from Fukushima as one of the potential causes uh, for these poor Arctic ring seals up in Alaska and the things that are happening to them. Their hair is falling out. Uh, they're having lesions on their vital organs and on their skin. And they have been unable to find any viruses, bacteria, algae, uh, molds, anything that could have done this to them. It's in none of the fish that they ate. But they're now going to be testing for radiation. Now, unfortunately, they say it's going to take several weeks. Um, I hope you all realize that it does not take that long to test for radiation. Uh, but this is progress uh, nonetheless. So thank you so much uh, to Anonanoid. Uh, you can see even there, Noah uh, can't figure out what's going on. Uh, but big ups. Keep your eyes open, folks. Be safe. The Fukushima nuclear crisis says it was down to the plant's operators being ill-prepared and not responding properly to the quake and tsunami disaster. A major government inquiry said some engineers abandoned the plant as the trouble started and other staff delayed reporting significant radiation leaks. To discuss more on this, I'm joined by Professor Christopher Busby, Scientific Secretary at the European Committee on Radiation Risks. Thanks for joining us. So the report claims operators failed to respond properly, and you said before that the authorities had been lax and slow in handling the situation. To what extent do you feel the assessment's been confirmed by these findings? Well, I think my assessment has been con confirmed 100%, but, but I, I do have to say that I don't think that, uh, that this inquiry has gone far enough because there are lots of questions that they haven't asked and there are lots of questions that still haven't been answered. What are some of those? Well, the main, the most important one uh, is has to do with the um, the health effects of the contamination. Now, that it, it, it's kind of assumed that 
everybody knows that these health effects are, are not going to be serious. But like, just like I said before, that this was a much more serious incident than anyone had, uh, ha, ha, was suggesting at the time. I'm now saying, or have been saying all along, that the health effects will be very much more serious than anyone is saying now. And I can tell you that there will probably be in some years' time another inquiry which will show also that I'm right there. And this is really sad because actually if they did concede that there was a big problem, then people could be, could be moved out and, and other, uh, other activities could take place which would ensure that fewer people got sick than are going to. Why do you think it's taken Japan so long to admit that its response was inadequate? I think that there's an enormous pressure from the nuclear industry and from the people who, who stand to, to lose a lot of money with regard to the, the general uh, nuclear expansion scenario that we've been seeing in the last year or two. I mean, for the, for the nuclear industry, this was an absolute disaster. And it does seem to me from not only the way in which the Japanese have been constrained to handle this uh, this, this event, but also the way in which people all over the world are handling this event through the media. I have to say, not Russia today, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, that there does seem to be an enormous uh, uh, iron grip on the media with regard to the effects of this, of this terrifying accident, this, this catastrophe. The report also said the government published understated figures on the spread of the radiation. Can that be justified when millions of lives are at risk? Well, of course, that uh, uh, really is a, is a criminal event, as I said before, you know, that, that, that this is criminal irresponsibility because if people had known the extent of the radioactivity, had, uh, had, had the government uh, and, and also, I have to say, the International Atomic Energy Agency come clean with the extent of the contamination, people would have left, people would have got out, and these people who didn't get out will have been seriously contaminated, and this will affect their health. So, so really, this is quite a criminal affair, and I, I would hope that eventually somebody would would be brought to justice, or at least there should be some court case about it. Now, Japanese officials claim the plant is now under control, but there have been reports that many Fukushima evacuees remain reluctant to return to their homes. Do you think those concerns are valid? I think that those people should not return to their homes, and I think that it's extremely unlikely that, the, uh, that these reactors are in what they call cold shutdown. I mean, I think this is discourse manipulation. The, 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 uh, very recently, xenon isotopes were being released from those, uh, those plants, and these xenon isotopes have sufficiently short half-lives for us to know that fissioning is still taking place in those reactors. All right, and briefly, what do you think should be done with the Japanese nuclear network now? Well, you know, the Japanese nuclear network was always dangerous. It was always built on the coast in areas where there were tsunamis. It was always built in areas where there were possibly going to be um, uh, earthquakes. And so really, if I were the Japanese people, I would demand that the government close down the entire nuclear operation in Japan and revert to some other form of generating energy. What would that be, do you think? Well, uh, the, uh, it, there have been studies made that show that, Japanese, Jap that, that Japan is very, very um, rich in, in wind power. And there are lots of ways in which uh, you can get alternative generation of, ele of electricity. But the main problem, of course, is that there's too much electricity being used. We, we, are, we are burning up the planet in order to continue with a lifestyle which is really not sustainable. And I think that is the real answer to all of these questions about nuclear and fossil fuel and all the rest of it. We, we just, we're just burning too much fuel. All right, we have to leave it there. Professor Christopher Busby of the European Committee on Radiation Risks, thanks for your time. Tokyo Electric Power Company says it will use an industrial endoscope to study the inside of a damaged reactor at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The utility says a 10-meter long, 8-millimeter wide device will be deployed from next month. It plans to measure temperatures and other conditions inside the containment vessel at the number 2 reactor. The endoscopy will provide the first opportunity to see the inside of a containment vessel at the plant since nuclear fuel melted down in March. The nuclear fuel is believed to have melted through the wall of the pressure vessels and accumulated on the bottom of the containment vessels. The government announced on December 16th that all reactors have been brought under control, but there is little information on the conditions inside the reactor's containment vessels. The government announced on December 16th that all reactors have been brought under control, but there is little information on the conditions inside the reactor's containment vessels. Tokyo prosecutors and police are trying to answer those questions.
A face-off is brewing between Fukushima Prefecture and Tokyo Electric Power Company over decommissioning its nuclear plants in the region. Governor Yuhei Sato met with TEPCO President Toshio Nishizawa in Fukushima. It was their first meeting since Nishizawa assumed the president's post in June. Governor Sato explained the prefecture's intention to request all nuclear plants in Fukushima be shut down. He said Fukushima hopes to build a society which doesn't rely on nuclear power. He added that many children have been forced to evacuate their homes since the nuclear accident. The governor urged Nishizawa to think deeply about the current hardship of the Fukushima people. During the meeting, Nishizawa had no comment on the decommissioning issue. Now the Agriculture Ministry has decided to buy up all the rice in those districts. The ban was imposed after radiation tests showed rice recorded levels above 500 becquerels per kilogram. Since then, the government has tightened its safety standards, lowering the level to 100 becquerels per kilogram. The ministry says it will buy up all the rice in the eight districts, as well as any other crops shown to be contaminated under the new standard. The ministry will ask Tokyo Electric Power Company, the operator of the Fukushima plant, to pick up the bill. It estimates that it will have to buy about 4,000 tons of contaminated rice. Japan's forestry agency has collected cedar cones in Fukushima Prefecture to test for radi radioactive cesium ahead of pollen season. It found that radioactivity from airborne pollen will not pose a health hazard. Cones from 87 locations were collected from the late November to early December. Officials detected extremely high radiation levels of 253,000 becquerels per kilogram in cones from the town of Namie. That's in the no-entry zone about 11 kilometers from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. 29 other locations saw levels exceed 10,000 becquerels. But the agency says if people are exposed to the pollen of these cones for four months, they would breathe in only about a half a microsievert of radiation. This is really sad because actually if they did concede that there was a big problem, then people could be, could be moved out and, and other, uh, other activities could take place which would ensure that fewer people got sick than are going to. The agency points out that this is only about 10 times what a person would be exposed to from a normal background radiation in central Tokyo. An explosion, a radioactive cloud, serious contamination. It was Sweden that alerted us. Three days after the accident, while Gorbachev is still trying to gather data, American and European spy satellites turn to the Soviet Union and discover the ruins of the Ukrainian plant. The smoke, wafting from the gaping hole, shows up clearly in thermal vision. In the evening of that Monday, the 28th it would be, uh, we had a message from the Mr. Petrosians, who was the head of Atomic Energy Commission in Russia, uh, in which he told us about the accident. And uh, about the same time, the Russians actually released the information to the world. Obviously, over at the Politburo, we immediately decided it was essential that all facts be reported to us from then on. So I called on the KGB. I told them to follow everything that was happening over there and to report the conversations the scientists were having. I told them to report all of that information back to me personally. It has taken over 48 hours to get accurate information about the disaster. Two days during which the 43,000 inhabitants of Pripyat are exposed to contamination. The crisis continues to grow. At the bottom of the destroyed reactor, 1,200 tons of white-hot magma continue to burn at over 3,000 degrees, sending liters of radioactive gas and dust into the atmosphere. The whole of Europe is at the mercy of the winds. crisis, General Antochkin and his fleet of 80 helicopters are sent from Moscow to fight the blaze and put the fire out.
When he arrives, the general flies 200 meters above the blown out reactor. Because of the fire, the temperature at that height was between 120 to 180 degrees Celsius. Our dosimeter, the instrument for measuring radiation, only went up to 500 rankins. The needle was going crazy. It was completely off the scale. I think there were at least 1,000 rankins at a height of 200 meters. Even at that altitude, a half hour of exposure could be lethal. The strong current of radioactive hot air streaming up from the reactor makes it impossible to get closer. They will have to improvise some way of carrying out their mission. Players, this is what you've all been waiting for. The Japanese government wants to build facilities to temporarily store radioactive soil in the district where the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant is located. The environment minister has officially asked local officials for permission. Waiting for you to take it away. Environment Minister Goshi Hosono on Wednesday met Governor Yuhei Sato of Fukushima Prefecture. Hosono said the Futaba district was chosen for the interim storage sites because areas exposed to over 100 millisieverts of radiation per year are concentrated there. However, the bad news is there's some whammies. Both he said the government will buy or lease land with high radiation levels on a long-term basis to build the sites. The governor said he would discuss the plan with municipalities in the affected district. No whammies! The facility would be used to hold radioactive soil removed from the contaminated areas. The government believes the waste would be stored at these sites for up to 30 years before being taken out, of, taken out for final treatment. Stop! 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 on Wednesday also met with the mayors of eight municipalities of the Futaba district to ask for permission. It's like being given a serious assignment. The matter concerns the entire district. We must examine it thoroughly. At HK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa joins us with more details. So Mitsuko, I recall TEPCO issued an interim report on Fukushima accident earlier this month. Right. Now. There is a new report from the government panel. Mm -hmm. How do these probes differ? Well, the typical report was drafted by specialists handpicked by the utility, but the government report comes from an independent committee, so it could be seen as more objective. TEPCO's report did touch on how the meltdowns occurred, but it failed to clarify the root cause of the accident. For the first time, this new report clearly states the Japanese government played a role in making the crisis worse. It says the government wasn't prepared for three disasters, a big earthquake, a tsunami, and a nuclear accident. It says communication was insufficient between the Prime Minister's office and the crisis management center, which was responsible for gathering updated information on Fukushima. What about Tokyo Electric Power Company? What does this report say about TEPCO? Mm -hmm. Well, it explains in detail the errors TEPCO workers made right after the earthquake and tsunami hit Fukushima Daiichi. They were late to respond to the problems with reactor number one. They fell behind in their attempt to cool down the reactor. They failed to use the only workable cooling system called the isolated condenser after the plant lost its major power sources. The condenser uses steam to cool it down, but neither workers, the task force on the site, nor officials at headquarters knew how to operate the condenser at the time of the emergency. But neither workers, the task force on the site, nor officials at headquarters knew how to operate the condenser at the time of the emergency. The report says as the operator of a nuclear plant, TEPCO's lack of knowledge was extremely inappropriate. It says there could have been ways to slow down the pace of meltdowns and lessen the leakage of radiation outside a plant. So what is the next step to get to the bottom of what happened at mm -hmm. Fukushima Daiichi? Mm -hmm. Well, the Independent Government Committee is scheduled to finalize this report by the summer of 2012 after interviewing officials and ministers who were in charge during the time of the accident. The committee is calling for fundamental and drastic changes to nuclear safety and disaster response policy. Right, NHK World's Mitsuko Nishiko are you for us tonight? Mitsuko, thank you. Appreciate it. Officials have declared a state of emergency. What's happening?
Why don't y'all come on the truck? You look at him again, I'll shoot you in the head. I don't think you killed a man in your life. They're gonna catch up with us. They're gonna catch up with us, and they're going to kill us. Everything depends on reaching the coast. I told you I would do. Like what? Like what? Kill anyone who touches you. Cause that's my job. It's like it used to be when the sun came out. We're gonna die. We're not gonna quit. We're gonna survive this. Japanese nuclear experts investigating the cause of the Fukushima nuclear accident on behalf of lawmakers will begin full-fledged work in January. The panel was set up by the Diet and is independent of the government. We will examine reports from the IAEA in Tokyo Electric and an interim report from the government investigation team. We want to focus on problems they were unable to address. The panel will scrutinize how then Prime Minister Naoto Kan and other senior government officials responded to the nuclear crisis. It will also propose ways to change Japan's nuclear policy and an administrative systems to prevent another nuclear accident. The panel will submit its findings in about six months. Japan's ruling party has come up with a way to pay for the rising costs of Social Security. The Democrats plan to raise the national sales tax. The decision came after nearly nine hours of debate. The current consumption tax uh, rate is 5%. DPJ members agreed to raise it to 8% in April 2014, then to 10% in October 2015. Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda faced strong opposition, so he decided to delay the start of the new system by six months. But that wasn't enough, so the party executives amended the plan. The revisions include reducing by 80 the number of seats in the lower house and salary cuts for public servants. The plan allows the tax hike to be suspended depending on the economic situation. Noda faces dissidents within his own party, too. Some have already left the Democrats to protest the tax hike. His administration hopes to submit the bill to the Diet by the end of March. Radiation levels now for eight plus months uh, have been off the charts in many areas of the United States. Different isotopes, readings in the milk and the uh, vegetables that are grown on the surface. Cows then, of course, eat the grass off the surface and it bioaccumulates. In some cases, uh, milk has had over 100 times what they say is normal or safe levels in it. But now they just wave magic wands and raise the isotope levels and say it's safe. Wasn't safe in 86 with Chernobyl. Now they just wave magic wands. And they wave magic trendy wands uh, because the New York Times or Michael Medved say so. 
you know, it's good for you. It's like the London Guardian now says it's trendy and radiation's good for you. George Monbiot actually said it's wonderful. Anyone that doesn't like it is insane. And you just wave a trendy, know-it-all, bossy wand, and everyone is supposed to listen to you. Kind of like Ron Paul. They wave a magic wand and say, he can't win. You're not supposed to vote for him. He's dangerous. He's evil. He's bad. And you're supposed to get in line and say, oh, my gosh, a group of confirmed deceivers and manipulators and preemptive warmongers who've helped turn America into a bankrupt cesspit of global tyranny uh, are now telling me new lies. It'd be like getting at the end of a sewage pipe and watching all the horrible affluent, the detritus come out, and then, and then somebody says, you know, I wouldn't sit there and uh, get a spoon and eat what's coming out of the end of that, and you see all this black sludge coming out, and they look at you and say, you're a conspiracy theory. Uh, this is uh, apple pie, because the government-run media said so. And they're like, but it stinks. It's coming out of the end of a sewage pipe. And they're like, shut up, conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theory is thinking and asking questions and not believing out of hand what confirmed known liars say. And so I am a conspiracy theorist. I'm going to admit it right now. Uh, we've had a bunch of top scientists on, probably more than, I don't know, 20 or so in the last nine months since Fukushima happened. And the fastest currents from Japan go up to Alaska and northern Canada. And uh, they reported just a few months into it. A massive increases in radiation levels in the fish uh, and in seals. And now MSNBC is reporting scientists test sick Alaska uh, seals for radiation. And uh, it looks like they're dying of radiation poisoning. Nothing like seal teeth falling out. Nothing like their hair falling out. Nothing like blood coming out of them uh, as it, all the fast-growing tissue dies. You get hit with radiation, that's what happens. Your, your gums die and start bleeding fast growing cells are hit the, that's why children are so susceptible because they're 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 fast growing cells everything in their body is a fast growing cell except for eggs in a child's ovaries if it's a girl and your eyeballs that's it everything else is changing and growing and you get hit with radiation it's much worse but an adult only thing that's really fast growing is your skin your gums your mucous membranes your intestines and a few other things. And boy, when you get hit with radiation, bye-bye intestine lining, bye-bye teeth. And that's happening to the seals. When radiation levels spiked massively from Fukushima nine months ago, the fastest sea corridors bringing uh, the, 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 the radiation to North America within a month and a half had hit Alaska. And we had reports then of radiation levels going off the charts. What did the EPA do? federal government, they just raised the level of what they said was safe. They said, you know what, this isotope's gone up, we'll just raise the level of what we say safe. Well now, seals with damaged flippers and hair loss are being killed by radiation from Fukushima plant, biologists warn. And they've done the test, the radiation level has gone up. They first thought it was a virus, but they're not testing positive. That same wreckage of all the tsunami uh, cities and towns, that got carried out to sea. Water traveled in some cases in a month and a half to the coast of the U.S. and Canada and Alaska. The wreckage started hitting three weeks ago, and it's highly radioactive. All those houses, all those reactor parts, that's hitting the West Coast. Kids are dropping dead all over Japan. Heart failure from the radiation. And our government's response, the Japanese government's response, is everything's fine. In 86, with Chernobyl in the Ukraine, the Russians said, don't drink milk, don't eat surface food for six months, we've got to ship it in. All of Europe refused to eat the food. They shipped it in from America and other areas. For much lower radiation, this time they're saying, just go ahead and take it. Everything is fine. It's going to be good for you. Keep working on it, Japan. Okay, Ted, what's the problem? Hello, Betty. What's the problem? I haven't got a problem. I've got fucking problems. Plural. Wanna hear? Sure. Well, most recently, 
There's room 309. Here's a look at how people and animals are marking the end of 2011 here in Japan. A Shinto shrine in a rice-growing town made an offering of a huge rice cake. It's a way to thank the gods for this year's harvest and ask them for a quick recovery from this year's earthquake and tsunami. The rice cake is nearly a meter high and weighs 500 kilograms. A forklift carried the two lower layers to the hall of worship. It took 12 shrine attendants to lift the top layer into place. They topped it off with a huge piece of fruit that's also part of this New Year tradition. Animals are also marking the end of the year. A sea lion named Jay is practicing writing the Chinese character for dragon, the zodiac sign for 2012. Jay will soon show off his writing skills at New Year events.
Following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the Japanese government raised the level of allowable radiation exposure from 1 to 20 millisieverts per year, even for children. On April 19th, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology announced that the amount of radiation a child can be exposed to in one year is 20 millisieverts. Officials proclaim that 20 millisieverts per year is safe, but is it? In this video we'll test the official claim of safety against established radiobiological science. The same science upon which the United States National Academy of Sciences predicts that 20 millisieverts of radiation will not only cause cancers all across Fukushima, but will primarily kill women and children. In this video we'll also test the official claim of safety against recently published research, such as the largest study of nuclear workers ever conducted, comprising over 400,000 workers from 15 countries. The study found increased cancer mortality among nuclear workers exposed to an average of 2 millisieverts per year. That's just one-tenth of the allegedly safe 20 millisieverts per year allowed in Fukushima. In this video we'll see that the public is being misled by governments and major media into a false sense of safety regarding nuclear fallout obstructing the ability of citizens to be fully informed so that we can make sound decisions that direct our democracies to safe energy futures. So stay tuned as we cover all that and more. The United States National Academy of Sciences is a logical resource to consult about the state of radiation science and the Academy regularly publishes reports on low-dose radiation risks. The reports are based on decades of epidemiological and radiobiological research from which risk-predicting models are built. The Academy's most recent report provides both raw data and instructions so that you can apply their risk models to a wide range of exposure scenarios. We can therefore find the cancer risk of 20 millisieverts. This is the Academy's data table for estimated cancer cases caused by 100 millisieverts of radiation, stratified by age and segregated by sex. Highlighted in yellow are the predicted number of cases for all cancers per 100,000 persons. Immediately we can see that the risk of cancer uniformly decreases as age increases for both males and females. In other words, children are most vulnerable to radiation. Plotting these data yields this graph. This cancer risk graph keeps the shape irrespective of its dose. This shape is therefore the face of radiation-induced cancer risk across the human lifespan. Following the Academy's instructions on scaling the model to specific doses, the y-axis is recalibrated to the predicted cancer cases caused by the allegedly safe 20 millisieverts. And here in turn are recalibrations for 10 and for 2 millisieverts. According to the Academy, there is no harmless dose of radiation. So, obviously 20 millisieverts is not safe. But what's most remarkable is that children, and most especially girls, are the most at risk of radiation-induced cancer. In fact, girls are almost twice as vulnerable as same-aged boys and a five-year-old girl is five times and an infant female seven times more vulnerable than a 30-year-old man. These data from the National Academy of Sciences are freely available to all major media and government officials. Yet rather than informing the public of the actual state of radiation science and the real risks of nuclear power, 
They lead us instead to believe that 20 millisieverts of radiation is either safe or its effects are a complete mystery. Residents travel to Tokyo to protest after the government loosened safety limits, despite the fact that the long-term impact of low-dose radiation is unknown. The long-term impact of low-dose radiation is unknown. Even worse than a failure to inform, major media lead the public to believe that scientific models of low-dose radiation risk, such as we've just reviewed, don't even exist. Yet outside the media's cocoon of blissful ignorance, science marches forward, further characterizing the risks of low-dose radiation. And the flow of incoming evidence, published since the Academy's last report in 2006, suggests that the Academy's risk model is either accurate or may underestimate risk. In 2007, the largest study ever conducted on occupational low-dose radiation exposure was published. The study contained over 400,000 nuclear industry workers from 15 countries. The study found a significant relation between radiation dose and cancer mortality. The average period of nuclear worker employment in the study was 10.5 years and the average dose accumulated over those years was 19.4 millisieverts. This implies an average annual dose of 1.85 millisieverts per year. To get a more accurate estimate of the average annual dose, this data table showing the average cumulative dose and years of employment for each country is useful. From these data, we find that the average annual dose for the whole cohort was 1.95 millisieverts per year, rounding off to 2 millisieverts per year. The data provided by the study also allow calculation of the median annual dose of the whole cohort, which was lower still, at merely 0 0.45 or one half of a millisievert per year. So the representative dose rate among the nuclear workers in the study was at most one-tenth of the 20 millisieverts per year allowed in Fukushima. So with an allowance of 20 millisieverts per year, Fukushima children may receive up to 10 times the dose rate associated with increased cancer among adult nuclear workers. To get a sense of the distribution of exposures over the cohort, 90% of the workers in the study received cumulative doses under 50 millisieverts over their entire period of employment, which overall was 10.5 years on average. So dividing 50 millisieverts by 10.5 years suggests that the dose rate for most of the workers was probably below 5 millisieverts per year which is just one-fourth of the maximum annual dose for Fukushimans. To get a sense of the distribution of the radiation effect over the 15-country cohort, the authors eliminated each country from the study one at a time to see if eliminating one country's data eliminated the indicated radiation effect. In each sub-analysis, they found that the excess risk ratio, or ERR, was higher than, but compatible with, the National Academy of Sciences BEER-7 risk model, which was the risk model we previously reviewed. So the indicated radiation effect was not biased by data from any particular country. The authors of the study noted that worker smoking is a possible confounding factor, since lung cancer was common among the workers. However, other smoking-associated cancers showed little relation to radiation dose, and the authors concluded that even if smoking played a role, it cannot fully account for the dose relation of cancer to radiation. So let's recap. The 15-country study, authored by 51 radiation scientists, 
is the largest study ever conducted of nuclear workers. It found increased cancer risk among the workers. The average worker dose was two millisieverts per year. Most workers received under five millisieverts per year. And the maximum dose allowed in Japan is 20 millisieverts per year. That's 10 times higher than the average annual worker dose and four times higher than most worker doses. Two years later, in 2009, Jacob and colleagues analyzed the 15-country study we just reviewed, plus eight other nuclear worker studies. What makes nuclear worker exposure especially relevant to areas contaminated by nuclear fallout is that both exposure scenarios deliver doses at a slow, persistent rate. And the meta-analysis of Jacob and colleagues suggests that such slow dose rates might be more harmful than fast dose rates. For example, this chart from Jacob et al. shows excess cancer mortality risk found in nine studies of nuclear workers. Each study is denoted by a red dot whose rightward displacement from zero risk along the bottom axis denotes the degree of increased risk found in that study. In contrast, the blue dots represent the comparative excess risk among the atom bomb survivor cohort, adjusted to match the sex ratio and average age of the nuclear workers in each study. As we can see, the red dots are usually more rightward displaced than the blue dots, and therefore most nuclear worker studies found a higher risk of cancer mortality than among atom bomb survivors. This is a significant finding because radiation risk models are largely founded upon fast dose exposures, like from the atomic bomb blasts, and it has been assumed that fast dose rates were more harmful. However, the findings of Jacob and colleagues brings this view into question. As an editorial on the findings of Jacob et al. in the journal Occupation and Environmental Medicine observed, quote, A number of recent studies challenge the assumption that low dose rate exposures to penetrating forms of ionizing radiation are less effective at causing cancer than high dose rate exposures because risk estimates for people who received low dose rate exposures tend to be larger than or similar to the corresponding estimates derived from the study of Japanese atomic bomb survivors. End of quote. This graph from Jacob et al demonstrates the discrepancy of risk models. The two leading risk models are on the left. The second is the National Academy of Sciences cancer risk model we examined previously. Both risk models are based largely on the fast dose rate exposure experienced by atomic bomb survivors. But the third bar on the right represents the higher level of risk derived from the slow dose rate experienced by nuclear workers. So the cutting edge of meta-analytical research suggests that the leading contemporary radiation risk models may actually underestimate the carcinogenic efficiency of low-dose radiation. Science is not only further clarifying the harmful effects of low-dose radiation on large-scale macroscopic levels, but on the microscopic level as well. Recent research has increased the fidelity of data in the low-dose range regarding radiation-induced genetic damage. Chromosomal translocations are a form of genetic damage resulting from the faulty repair of DNA molecules damaged by genotoxic chemicals or radiation. Chromosomal translocations, also known as chromosomal aberrations, are believed to result in many forms of cancer. 
and an increased frequency of chromosomal aberrations is recognized as an indication of an increased risk of cancer. As such, radiation-induced chromosomal aberrations are fundamental to the causal mechanism of radiation-induced cancer. It has been well documented that medium to high dose radiation increases chromosomal aberrations, but the influence of low dose radiation has been less certain. But if this mechanism of radiation induced cancer occurs at low doses, there would be little reason to doubt that low dose radiation can cause cancer. In 2010, Bhatti and colleagues published a meta-analysis of studies that examined the influence of medical x-ray examinations on the incidence of chromosomal translocations. They sought to gain greater precision on the impact of low-dose radiation by pooling data from multiple studies. Not only did they find a dose response in the low-dose range, but to their surprise, the frequency of chromosomal aberrations per unit of radiation increased below approximately 20 millisieverts. Moreover, at doses below approximately 10 millisieverts, the frequency of aberrations per unit of radiation increased further still, and by an order of magnitude. Given these findings, evidence for the carcinogenicity of radiation at low doses could hardly be more logically indicated. Let's examine this formally. The hypothetical syllogism is a two-premise argument schema of classical logic of the form. Given that, if it's the case that P, then Q, and if it's the case that Q, then R, then we may conclude that it's also the case that if P, then R, Plugging the scientific evidence we've just reviewed into the hypothetical syllogism, we may reason as follows. Given that, if there's low-dose radiation, then there's more chromosomal harm, and if there's more chromosomal harm, then there's more cancer, then we may conclude that if there's low-dose radiation, then there's more cancer. To some degree, this syllogism may be an oversimplification. However, our inputs in this valid argument schema are the outputs of state-of-the-art biological research. In this video, we've reviewed both established radiobiology and recent radiobiological research. From this broad scientific base, we've observed that the National Academy of Sciences predicts increased cancer risk from exposures below 20 millisieverts per year. Research published since the Academy's last report in 2006 corroborates that prediction. Recent research also suggests that the Academy's risk model may underestimate cancer risk. Recent research also finds that radiation exposures below 20 millisieverts are associated with genetic damage. Therefore, both historical and cutting-edge scientific research consistently demonstrate that Japan's allowance of 20 millisieverts per year is not safe.